and if you uh, click on the three vertical dots and choose change layout uh, I think spotlight might be your best option to, uh, to see Colonel Beach's screen the best when he's sharing it oh, okay I thought you were talking about my screen so uh, Sam, I was just going to put it on presentation mode. I assume that's the best way for me to do it. Uh, let's give it a shot. All right. Yep, that works. Okay. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rick Veach. Uh, I am uh, for the uh, Missouri Wing, the Director of Standards and Evaluation, which is a fancy way of saying that myself and a really good team of instructors and check pilots are responsible for the um, flight standards and our renewal process and check rides and so forth and so on. Uh, also joining me tonight as part of the presentation is Captain Sam Samarasinga. Uh, Sam is the um, Director of Operations um, for Missouri Wing, and as such, he is my functional boss, and he's also heavily involved in emergency services um, in the state, and also with the operation maintenance uh, and care of our various aircraft and vehicles and drones and so forth in the state. Um, as Sam uh, mentioned, um, we are recording this uh, video uh, tonight, uh, just so everybody is aware. Um, I believe that attending, there is a combination of CAP members and non-CAP members. So uh, I'm going to try to speak um, such th uh, with the assumption that um, you may not know all the CAP lingo and all, but I may not always succeed with that. So feel free to ask any uh, questions as we go through or about the content in general. Um, so if you can use the hold up a hand uh, symbol on the screen to raise a question, um, Sam will uh, monitor that. Um, or if you know how to use the chat, uh, function you can use that as well sam will monitor that and he will uh, interject with any questions and so forth and if you can't figure out how to do any of that just don't be afraid to uh, unmute and interrupt we'd be glad to entertain any questions um, as we go through the presentation all right so the overall agenda tonight is you know, try to go through the opportunities to become a pilot within uh, Silver Air Patrol. And within that, what are the what are the opportunities for pilots who are in CAP, but for whatever reason um, have are not current anymore and have become rusty and would like to get back at it as a pilot. And then we're going to touch on the onboarding process. Just how you know, what's our procedure for getting new to CAP? pilots uh, flying for Silver Air Patrol, and then the same thing for non-current pilots. So drilling down a little bit more on the objectives, really we're going to focus on uh, CAP senior members. We're not going to talk about cadets uh, tonight. Um, and I want to go through the processes and, and requirements, whether you are new to CAP and you already hold a private pilot certificate, or maybe you are a CAP member who just got your private pilot certificate outside of CAP, and now you want to start flying for Silver Air Patrol. And really the processes for both of these two categories are virtually the same. Um, but then also we have current senior members who might be thinking about, well, gee, can I get my private pilot certificate using CAP resources. So we'll touch on that as well. Um, we're gonna talk about the processes and the training opportunities, as I mentioned, for CAP pilots whose currency has lapsed for whatever reason. And we'll talk um, 
a fair amount about funding because there's various things we can do that are funded and then there's additional things that we can do um, that are not funded that is the uh, senior member pays uh, for use of the aircraft and so forth um, uh, and also as part of that uh, the availability of instructors and so forth is is also an issue and we'll touch on that and then i'm not going to get too much into this but just touch briefly on some of the requirements for training in our qualification standard. So what I'm not going to cover tonight is, as I mentioned, uh, I'm not going to get into TAP cadets. Uh, Civil Air Patrol has a very robust um, program that's been in place for two or three years for CAP cadets. They have the availabil availability to receive scholarships from national um, to get their private pilot certificate within Silver Air Patrol. Um, so that's very nice, but we're not going to go through that tonight. Um, also for the wing and across national, the, um, the amount of small unmanned aircraft systems or drones has been increasing quite a bit um, and will continue to grow and is becoming a new total category of flight force, but uh, that is a totally, not totally, but a um, significantly different process. And I'm not going to get into that tonight uh, either. And also this discussion tonight is mainly centered on um, airplane, single engine air, uh, aircraft. And so we're not going to talk too much about gliders, although Sam, Sam might um, talk a little bit about that later on. Okay, so what's, what are the minimum requirements to fly an aircraft uh, within Silver Air Patrol? So uh, Silver Air Patrol has uh, lots of regulations and one of them is CAP Reg 70-1, which governs all of our uh, 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 rules for flying um, airplanes within Silver Air Patrol. And in there, it says to, to operate as a CAP pilot or glider, you have to be current uh, with an FAA uh, private pilot or higher certificate, and you have to be qualified uh, uh, as an FAA pilot as well. And what that really means is that you are current enough to have a flight review um, and so forth to uh, fly a CAP uh, pilot. So if you are familiar with recreational certificates or sport certificates within uh, the FAA, um, those are not, those certificates are not recognized by Silver Air Patrol. Uh, CAP has a air crew professionalism course that uh, you need to take. It's a one-time um, requirement uh, that's needed as well. And in Silver Air Patrol, um, we are required to take a, a flight evaluation with a check airmen every 12 months. Uh, the FAA uh, requires that pilots have a flight review every two years, but within Silver Air Patrol, we require it uh, every 12, 12 months. And in CAP, um, if you're in Silver Air Patrol, uh, you would recognize that in order to fly Silver Air Patrol airplanes, you have to have at least uh, reached level one in the education and training program. Uh, program. Uh, Rick, let me uh, step in for just a quick second. Uh, kind of the the overarching uh, minimum qualification to be a CAP pilot is a willingness to to serve. Uh, it's looking for an opportunity to donate your time, uh, flying for a purpose. Uh, Rick's been a, a member for quite a while and uh, does a tremendous amount of uh, of flying that that helps support our operations, but uh, it. You know, it's it's been a great volunteer organization for those of you who are still considering joining CAP. Uh, the the opportunities that we have to fly our cadets and uh, every once in a while fly a real world mission uh, makes the the effort that we go through to maintain our currency proficiency, uh, the check rides, uh, you know, meeting all these requirements. It, it definitely makes it worthwhile, at least uh, for me personally. So if you are you know if you're looking for an opportunity. Uh, to fly and have that flight time do some good, 
uh, CAP is definitely a great organization for that. Absolutely. Thanks, Sam. Um, so these are the minimum uh, qualifications to be a CAP pilot. I'm going to talk a little bit about flight instruction. What is permissible as far as flight training that you can receive in a CAP aircraft with CAP instructors? And you'll notice at this point, I'm not talking at all about what is really allowed uh, under all circumstances or what is fund funded. This is what is possibly permissible. So in the Civil Air Patrol, um, it is possible for you to receive flight instruction in a CAP aircraft with a CAP instructor to receive a private pilot certificate um, or further uh, ratings or further certificates such as instrument commercial pilot, uh, so forth and so on. Um, and I'll touch on those a little bit later because there are some significant restrictions around some of those. Um, then within Civil Air Patrol, there's a whole list of instruction that takes place that some of it is funded, um, but it, it is aimed at onboarding new members into Civil Air Patrol, the, the familiarization training with the aircraft, perhaps if it's in a new area of uh, airspace, or the airport, the training involved with that. Um, and then there's a fair amount of training just how to operate and deal with the qualification system within Civil Air Patrol, how to arrange use of the airplane, so forth and so on. That's all part of the onboarding uh, process. There's also training available for people, uh, as I've mentioned, who are rusty or haven't flown for a couple of years. Uh, to come back and fly for Civil Air Patrol. We have training available for uh, some of our aircraft have a uh, avionics system in it that's fairly advanced called G1000. And there's training available for uh, VFR level uh, flight um, visual flight rules and also for instrument flight rules um, training for G1000 use. Silver Air Patrol will also provide training for you if you onboard or you're very familiar with a Cessna 172 and you get rated in the 172 and Civil Air Patrol. So Civil Air Patrol will also provide um, training up to certain limits uh, for you to become rated in their other aircraft, uh, such as a Cessna 182. Um, over the last five years ago, Civil Air Patrol has invested very heavily in um, the proficiency of its pilots and the safety of our entire air crew. Um, and they've really put their money where their mouth is uh, because more than five or six years ago, to maintain proficiency as a Civil Air Patrol pilot, um, it was pretty much on the member's own dime uh, to fly Silver Air Patrol just for proficiency. But now there's a fair amount of funding available for that, and you can go up with an instructor if you so desire to improve your proficiency in whatever your rating is. And you can get uh, tr uh, training um, as part of the proficiency, proficiency flights to get ready for a Form 5. A Form 5 is our title, Civil Air Patrol's title for our check rides. Uh, we call that a Form 5. And then if you want to tow a glider, um, we provide training um, that's required for that as well. So all of the training that we uh, provide, particularly under the CAP uh, qualification related um, training, is governed by a series of standards that was put together about three or four years ago um, that provide, a, in some cases, a fairly detailed uh, syllabus. In other cases, just a um, sort of an overview of what, what's required. But nevertheless, there's a standard that covers every type of training that we are able to do <clears throat> in a CAP uh, airplane. So now I'm going to get into eligibility. So all these things are what 
might be permissible. So now we're going to talk about uh, eligibility. So first of all, and again, this is all in our 70-1 regulation, any CAP member is authorized to use CAP gliders and balloons, although Missouri doesn't have balloons, um, for initial or transition flight instruction for any FAA certificate. So you can join Civil Air Patrol, and once you get through being a level one and so forth, you could immediately um, be, you are immediately eligible to receive training in a glider uh, to uh, get your certificate for glider flying. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's funded because it's not, and you may have trouble finding an instructor for it, but you are eligible for that. This would also cover uh, the situation where if you are a private pilot uh, in airplane single engine land and you're interested in uh, getting transition training to get rated in a glider, um, senior members are el eligible for that as well. So another category of eligibility is for uh, cadets and um, CAP transport mission pilots. A, in Civil Air Patrol, a CAP transport mission pilot is typically a pilot that has at least 100 hours of pilot and command time. So it's, it's not, it's not uh, much experience. Uh, most pilots will, will get 100 hours of uh, PIC time within a year at least after getting their um, uh, private pilot certificate. So it's not a whole lot of time. But once you are uh, certified, or excuse me, you're a CAP transport mission pilot, then you are authorized to receive flight instruction uh, in powered aircraft toward an FAA certificate rating. So that would mean once I am a CAP transport mission pilot, I'm going to go back a little bit, I can use CAP resources, in other words, the airplane, um, to receive training to become instrument rated, as an example. Uh, now, as I'll get to, it's not funded, and you have to find an instructor, um, but um, uh, you are eligible. And I'm sorry, was there a question? Uh, in uh, CAP transport mission pilots are, uh we would use them on actual missions to transport aircraft, uh, personnel, equipment. Uh, they would not be able to take part in our uh, search and rescue actual flying yet. Uh, that is where the CAP mission pilots come in at 200 hours PIC. Uh, but we do occasionally need aircraft that are uh, moved around for maintenance or to help support missions or to uh, move emergency services qualified personnel uh, from their home bases to a mission base. Um, so uh, the transport mission pilots are, you know, a, a great starting point for a new CAP pilot. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, going further with some of the restrictions under eligibility. So if a CAP pilot who is not a transport mission pilot, in other words, this is a CAP pilot with less than 100 hours of PIC time, but he does have a private uh, pilot certificate. He's got a few further restrictions under him. So as long as he's got a private pilot certificate, though, and he's been a uh, CAP member for at least a year, he can obtain that same training in the CAP aircraft and with a CAP instructor but he's been here for, he has to have been here for a year and it does require the written authorization from uh, the wing or higher commander. So generally that's, that in the past has not been a big issue, it just depends on the situation. So all other senior members, so in other words, if you join Civil Air Patrol and you do not have a private pilot certificate, in order to receive training um, toward that, it requires 
the written authorization from uh, all the way up the line to the national commander. Um, and not only that, but that authorization only is granted if the member lives more than two hours drive from a commercial flight training facility. So for all intents and purposes, um, you as a senior member, you cannot receive training in a cap airplane, uh, even if you wanted to self-fund it, um, unless you already have a uh, private pilot certificate. There's probably not too many areas in the country that would be under this or over this two hour drive time. I'm sorry, somebody's got a question? Yep. Uh, the, uh, the section about holding at least a private pilot uh, certificate or higher uh, does mean if you've got uh, rotorcraft, glider, or balloon, uh, private pilot or higher, that will count uh, uh, to meet that eligibility requirement. Yep. <clears throat> yep. And that goes back to that transition training that I mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, so what about funding? Um, authorized obviously does not mean funded or available. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, for a little bit. So as I mentioned, flight instruction in, air, in an airplane. Now I'm not talking about gliders <clears throat> uh, at all here, um, but flight instruction in an airplane for your initial private pilot certificate is essentially not available. I would also say that to Sam's point, if you are a, a rotorcraft or a helicopter pilot, and we get a fair amount of those that come into um, Silver Air Patrol um, their army helicopter pilots and so forth and so on. And they are looking to get their airplane private pilot. Uh, they can do it. And, um, typically those folks have a little bit easier time, um, finding an instructor just because I think Civil Air Patrol bends over a little bit more for, uh, ex-military personnel that come into Civil Air Patrol, but it's still self-funded, uh, in that case. Uh, and that's what I'm referring to right here. Flight instruction for transition training is not funded. Um, if you are a private pilot and you want to get your instrument rating, uh, that's great. Um, but if you do it in a cap airplane, even though the instructor will be free, um, the, uh, uh, the airplane is not uh, funded. And in case, uh, if you're wondering, um, what it costs to fly um, Silver Air Patrol airplanes. This is our current um, hourly rate. So the Cessna 172 is 3370 an hour. That's flight hour. And Cessna 182 is 8470. And you can see what the gas uh, goes for. So that may, if, if you're not too familiar with aviation, that may seem like a lot. But if you go down to just about any airport and rent a 172 or 182 that are equipped um, and is in good a shape as our aircraft are, um, this is probably half of what you would spend um, at, uh, at a private um, rental place with an instructor. And the instructors these days are going for $50, $60 uh, an hour. I will say the reality of it is, um, you know, our instructors are, are pretty busy with um, the onboarding training, proficiency flights with members, uh, a variety of other things. The Czech pilots are very busy as well. And trying to find an instructor that has the time that it takes to uh, meet with somebody on the, the rhythm and frequency that it takes for somebody to be successful in getting another rating is hard hard to find. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. We've, we've, we've had a few people that have gotten their instrument or gotten their commercial certificates uh, in this manner, um, but I wouldn't count on it. Uh, so, but it is possible. 
So what is typically funded with instructors? So this is where I would say 99% of the time, there may be delays and all, but we can, we can team up a pilot with an instructor, and these are funded uh, flights within Silver Patrol. So I'll go through the process in more detail later, but if you're a new, if you are a new CAP member and you've gotten your level one and uh, you're ready to go um, and you have a private pilot certificate, you will be eligible um, for funded uh, onboarding training within certain limits. And I'll go through that here in a bit. All same thing with return to flight. So rusty pilot, um, uh, same thing that's funded as well. If you are a, um, a private pilot, but do not have a high performance endorsement, which you need for the one set, excuse me, the 182, uh, or a GA8, which we used to have in the wing. Um, this is uh, funded, uh, within Civil Air Patrol now. And the same thing for the transition training needed for the uh, G-1000 avionics equipped uh, aircraft. And now uh, this is uh, fairly new. Um, most of the check rides themselves, including your first one, are now funded. These all used to be self-funded um, a few years ago. And then there's some that are partially funded. I mentioned the high performance already. Um, this is really a, a, a matter of how long does it take the pilot uh, to become proficient in the training. Um, and frankly, with the, the funding levels that we have right now, we are able and we try to be reasonably lenient with this because we want, you know, we're, we're trying to encourage people to Get their training in, in advance um, but nevertheless if somebody is just flat out going to take uh, too much time we may um, have to withhold the funding and require the person to go outside of cap or just do it self-funded within cap and that's the same for becoming a tow pilot um, and then as i mentioned uh within the cap qualified qualification stuff, just about all these um, are typically funded with the same type of restriction. So if you if you are joining Silver Air Patrol and you haven't flown in 20 years and the last plane you flew was not anywhere near a Cessna 172 and you don't know anything about modern avionics, it might take you more than the two or three or four onboarding flights that CAP typically um, will fund. And we may ask you to get more current um, with a outside instructor um, within reason uh, before you start your onboarding um, training. Same thing with the return to flight. And I already talked about some of these, but uh, typically we're able to fund just about all that to get that done. So I, I mentioned funding um, in the last two or three years, our, our funding levels for this kind of operation has been uh, fairly generous. Um, we're able to provide all our um, pilot members a certain amount of proficiency hours per month to fly and along with that the training that i've gone through um, for people to advance uh, and gain these other ratings however once in a while you know the government um, and funding being what it is uh, that can change and there have been times in the past where funding has been cut and we've had to be uh, more restrictive and i've already talked about the instructor availability um, we are continuing to work to bring more instructors in. Um, that's an ongoing struggle. Uh, so depending on where you are in the state, the instructor availability may be an issue as well. 
Uh, Rick, um, we, ha we have a question uh, in regards to Form 5 funding. Uh, if a failure is made on a self-funded Form 5, is the recheck funded? Uh, so a failure is made on a, a self-funded check ride. And would the recheck be funded? I Well, um, I think that would all depend on why was the um self-funded form five self-funded to begin with um and i'm gonna i was going to touch on this in a minute but one of the cases where form fives is not are not funded is if a pilot for whatever reason is suspended and some of the time when that occurs for whatever reason um the form five the check ride is self funded and i would i'm not I, every every situation um when there's a, a pilot who's in that situation is somewhat different um so i don't think there's a patent answer that covers all circumstances but i guess my initial thought would be if it if it's because of a suspension and it was had to be self-funded, it would probably be self-funded again. That is about the only time um, now that I can think of that check rides and form fives are self-funded. They're just about all funded now. Okay. Um, so a point I wanted to make on just general funded funding uh, for CAP pilots. I already mentioned the funding for these. Um, CAP pilots also enjoy the opportunity um, <clears throat> to fly, I hate to call it free, but um, on funded flights for a very variety of other types of uh, Silver Air Patrol missions. These might be emergency services training, could be actual missions or search and rescue exercises, might be disaster assessment, uh, taking photos or videos of uh, floods and so forth. Um, we uh, enjoy the pilot proficiency training, um, maintenance relocation flights, orientation flights, and so forth and so on. It used to be, as I was mentioning uh, five or six years ago, that everything that just grayed out was not funded. Um, and the only things that were funded were the maintenance uh, flights and um, cadet orientation rides and actual missions. So if you were a, a um, CAP pilot several years ago, it wasn't unusual to be spending, depending on uh, your, own, your budget, um, two or three thousand dollars a year to fly, especially if you had to be rated, if you wanted to be rated in a new aircraft, because all that training to be um, trained in a 182 or or learn how to fly the G1000 was self-funded. So, so the the recent change as of five six years ago has been a a major benefit uh, for Civil Air Patrol, and I do think it adds to um, our uh, overall proficiency because people just aren't restricted by um, their um, their budget circumstances. So I'm going to change gears a little bit and talk about just what is the process to get onboarded. So per our one of our standards uh, for air crew training, pilots new pilots are eligible to complete a funded onboarding syllabus prior to their first check ride. Um, and when you're in a situation and you're starting out and uh, you're, be, you're, you're going to be onboarding, you know, there will be a conversation with the instructor and he's gonna to wanna to understand your currency, um, you know, when's the last time you flew, what kind of airplanes do you typically fly? Are they Cessna one? 72s, or are they archers, or so forth and so on. Um, 
it'll depend on what's our overall funding availability, you know, how many instructors do we have, and so forth and so on. And, and Sam mentioned in his comments uh, at the beginning, which we're right on, that um, for, for a person that's being onboarded, now I would say that we, we will typically throw everything at people to get them on, onboarded and um, get started within Civil Air Patrol. But nevertheless, if, if the pilot to be onboarded can also be immediately a uh, orientation ride pilot, that's pilots that um, provide uh, flights for our cadets, or you can be a mission pilot or an instructor, um, you're going to get a nod on the, on the um, priority for instructors and so forth. Um, so anyway, all this information is digested uh, yep. by the instructor and the he or she are going to put together a plan for you to uh, get started. And typically it'll, it'll, um, it'll uh, be made up of both uh, ground training content. And again, this depends on what your currency is, but even if you're really up on it on um, FAA, knowledge of flying you will be required to learn all the um stuff that it takes to fly within silver air patrol um and there's there's quite a bit to do it's not overwhelming uh, but it's it's a set of procedures that uh you will need to learn um and if possible we will team uh new uh, pilots that are coming on board with an experienced cat pilot to walk you through all this stuff and make it a little bit easier. Um, and the cat instructor will gauge what is your current aeronautical knowledge. Um, you know, if it's been a long time since you've flown, uh, a lot has changed in 20, 20 years from uh, not only just the basic regulations, but you know, GPS systems versus non-GPS systems, airspace is somewhat different. Um, there's just a lot that has changed. And they may recommend that you actually go and do a VFR pilot refresher uh, course with uh, Sporties or, or one of the other online um, schools uh, to get that done. And then uh, from a flight training content, um, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but in, in general, um, our, our um, flight uh, check rides are based on the FAA um, uh, standards for passing an FAA check ride. So when a pilot goes up with you as a uh, new pilot uh, onboarding for CAP, he's going to take you up and do a mock uh, form five with you. It's just going to go up and see see how you handle the pre-flight. How do you handle the plane? Um, how how do you how comfortable you are on um, doing the basic maneuvers required for a check ride, steep turns, um, stalls, and so forth, um, and pattern work. You know what's your ability to maintain situational awareness as far as <clears throat> the airspace and other traffic and talk on the radio and so forth and so on. But anyway, the pilot's going to do an assessment flight uh, with you uh, using these uh, points to, to gauge it on. And then um, uh, he will estimate, well, is this uh, is this potential pilot for Civil Air Patrol, is he going to be ready to go in one or two or three flights, or is it going to be a much longer process? Um, and uh, if he feels that the um, pilot uh, is fairly current and it won't take much to get him uh, able to pass a check ride, well, then those, those two or three flights required for that will generally be funded. If it's going to be much longer than that, well, then there will be another conversation of 
uh, are you willing to pay for these if the instructor is available or you might be asked to go uh, outside of CAP to get more current. So some uh, that, that does go back a little bit to, you know, uh, just from a, a lack of resources. Uh, Civil Air Patrol, just like everybody else, is constantly seeking, you know, instructors. We they are the ones we have are very gracious to donate quite a lot of their time. Um, by regulation, they cannot get uh, paid for their time. Uh, so it's in respect to that that we do have to have those those conversations uh, with those new pilots. If you know the training is just not going uh, as as rapidly as one would hope, and sometimes make that tough decision of we can't continue because we're we're tying up an instructor that unfortunately may be better served working with somebody else uh so it's it's not that we are we're not looking for uh for all pilots because eventually you know with with training we you know national and uh, us certainly do think that uh every pilot sh uh, at least has an op should be given the opportunity to proceed to a check ride and and be be able to become a, a cap pilot it's whether we have the resources to uh continue that training uh, and every pilot is different. I mean, um, the, uh, you know, uh, from everybody's pilot, private, private pilot training, it was always mentioned. It's a 40 hour minimum. Uh, how many actually complete in 40 hours? Same thing for, if you haven't been flying for a while, it's a very tough gauge sometimes to figure out how long is it going to take to, to get you back to where you could be a safe, proficient pilot and ready to pass a check ride. And we do try to respect our, our instructors, time when we make those decisions. Okay. Um, sometimes when the pilots are onboarding, there's some additional content. It, it's not unusual for a pilot to be, when he's being onboarded, that the only plane available is a G1000 Cessna 182. Well, um, that generally uh, requires additional time. And I'm not going to go through the details, but but we will, we being the wing, will uh, add on the amount of funding uh, that will be made available uh, for the G1000 part of it. And also if the pilot needs a high performance endorsement uh, to stack that onto it as well. So it's not unusual for an onboarding pilot that if he doesn't have some of this experience, to get four or five sorties as part of the uh, onboarding uh, process. So I mentioned the G1000, same thing with the high performance. There's a um, content that we have to take into account to get his or her um, high performance endorsement. And from a funding point of view, um, that is generally tacked on. Okay. so. Boiling this down a little bit further, and I've, I've probably touched on some of these things, so I'm going to try to be a little brief here. But, you know, what's what's our current practice? Um, you know, most of what I've mentioned and what was on the screen are the require the minimum requirements. So assuming the pilot is met, pilot is met with the uh, has the prerequisite requirements, you know, we're going to assign them to instructor. As I mentioned, the instructor is going to get to know them and, and do an assessment with them. And we'll go up for a assessment sortie and to see where he um, stands versus being able to pass a form five. Um, the instructor will do an estimate on that. And if it's no more than two sorties, that instructor is authorized, uh, pre-approved to go ahead and conduct two additional sorties as part of the onboard. Then, um, then the, the candidate would uh, go ahead and get a cap form five, which is also funded. So let's say the candidate is gotten through his two additional sorties and well, he's not quite there yet. The, the instructor feels he needs uh, another sortie, um, but he is making progress. Uh, that instructor will have a chat with me or Sam. And um, typically, if the trend is in the right direction, we'll go ahead and approve it. And um, um, 
and go ahead and fund that flight. On the other hand, if it starts to drag, then eventually we'll require that the pilot switch over to self-funding or go outside of Civil Air Patrol. And we already talked through all this, so kind of walked through this already. Um, and as Sam mentioned, sometimes the availability gets to be uh, a major issue and it depends on where in the state it is um, uh, with the availability of instruct instructors and in the aircraft. So, okay. Um, you know, the return to flight um, is almost the identical process. Uh, I just want to touch on a little bit though is it, it depends a little bit on the funding of why the cap pilot is rusty. So if, as I mentioned, came up in that question, if the pilot has an unsatisfactory form five or suspended for cause or mishap or anything like that, again, every one of these kinds of situations is different. So the use of the word may here is uh, prevalent, um, but depending on the situation, the uh, return to flight process um, will be dictated by a customized training syllabus, again, depending on why the pilot was uh, suspended. If it was, if the pilot was suspended because of a failure of a Form 5 or a similar event such as that, the uh, Director of Stan Evale, which is me in this case, uh, is uh, required to put together a customized training syllabus for that pilot. And depending on the situation, uh, that would be uh, funded or may not be funded. Typically, it is not uh, funded. Um, and also, uh, it's not always made, uh, CAP aircraft are not always made available either um, because of the resource issue. So very often uh, that pilot will have to go uh, outside a cap to um, rectify uh, the performance issue. Um, but other than that, uh, the return to flight, sometimes the pilots lose qualifications due, due to an, evident, an event beyond the pilot's direct control. So. You know, that could be uh, COVID-19, for example, uh, could be a deployment overseas, um, could be an illness, so forth and so on. Um, and then sometimes the pilot loses qualifications just due to their personal choice. They've decided to stop flying for whatever reason. Um, and depending on what the situation is, if, if the pilot has lost his currency, mainly because of things that are beyond the pilot's control, um, those will generally be funded. If it's because the, the pilot just didn't feel like flying for a while, then very often uh, the pilot will have to fund um, the training flights necessary uh, to become proficient. So I think I mentioned most of these kinds of things. Um, you know, Civil Air Patrol will rely on those who are around the, the, the senior member to help assess whether or not the um, time away from flying was truly a beyond the pilot's control situation or uh, due to his own choice. So, but anyway, as far as their process to return to flight, it's, all, it's, it's essentially identical um, to the um, new to cap onboarding process. Um, they are eligible to complete a return to flight syllabus uh, as dictated in the, the cap crew training standard. Um, again, the instructor will sit down with the uh, senior member and understand the pilot's currency, um, you know, what kind of aircraft, what, was the last he flew in, so forth, and so on, um, identical to um, 
a, a new uh, CAP member. What tends to be a little bit different is what training is required, especially on the CAP side. Usually um, CAP members who have stepped away from flying for a little bit are fairly familiar with the qualification system in CAP, the CAP regulations and the standards and so forth and so on. But, you know, things in CAP change too. So depending on how long that's been, uh, there may be a fair amount of training required here. And then the same thing for uh, a current or, or a rusty pilot. Um, they may need to go back for um, ground training uh, refresher with a, with a course such as sporties or something if it's been a while uh, since they've flown. And then they go up for the same kind of assessment flight. And after that, the, the process is exactly the same as for a, um, <clears throat> uh, a, a new member uh, within Civil Air Patrol. So this is all uh, just the same as um, a onboard flight. So I guess with that, I'll, I'll, we'll turn it over for any questions. Or Sam, did you want to comment on gliders? Uh, yeah, uh, might as well a little bit. So as far as the Missouri Wing Glider Program, uh, we have a Blanick L23 based near Harrisonville, Missouri. Uh, we currently have two glider instructors in the wing. Uh, so again, instructor time is at a, a premium. And then throw in the fact that, uh, you know, you got to get a tow plane, tow pilot, weather, weekend. Uh, the challenges start to, start to add up even more. Uh, but if you are... I, either interested in a glider rating or have your glider rating, uh, we can, you know, I'd definitely like to, to talk to you uh, at some point and see if we can start boosting that program as well. Um, opening up the, the floor to any questions. Hi, this is Paul Drake. Um, I do have a question. So, just a brief background. I have 190 hours pilot in command. Rejoined CAP. Um, all of the conversations that I've heard so far talk about Form 5 and such, but this is really before the Form 5. So what's the first step to actually get to getting into an airplane? Um, I'm, I'm assuming that I need to be assigned to an instructor, and, and I know that there's a couple of instructors in the region close to where I'm physically located, but what is the first step to actually get that process started? Okay. Uh, let's start with where are you located? Uh, so I'm in St. Louis, uh, the uh, Gateway Squadron, Okay. Senior Squadron. So uh, the squadron has... Uh, kind of the, the first step that they have to make is getting you working on your level one training. Uh, during that time, we have to get your documentation uploaded. So that's your pilot certificate, your medical, your uh, uh, evidence of flight review. Uh, there is the uh, statement of uh, understanding uh, that you have to take. Uh, those are all in ops quals. They, the squadron can also start training you on WIMRS, which is our web mission interface reporting system, uh, yep. which is how we manage the, the aircraft. Uh, once you've been paired up with an instructor, then it becomes a scheduling process between you, the instructor, the aircraft, the weather. Uh, and what we do ask uh, all the squadrons to do going forward is uh, you know, if they've got uh, pilots who are struggling with getting that scheduling done, is reach out to either Lieutenant Colonel Beach or me, and you know we'll see if there's an opportunity to bring in resources from outside that location. Uh, just to give you a, an idea, uh, Rick, how many how many instructor pilots do we currently have? About 13, 13, 14. Yeah, we've got about 13 yeah. instructor pilots, and they're of, of varying uh, activity levels, you know, given their uh, their day jobs and, you know, how much time they're they're able to to donate. 
Uh, and obviously geography is the other part of where are those 13 located? Do they happen to be close by enough to do that? Uh, so as far as first steps, if you've got the documentation done, you got level one done, next step would be working with your squadron to see about all right, uh, having a, uh, an instructor uh, that's willing to, to work with you to, to take that next step. And then, again, we would, we would ask that squadron if that's taking longer than what we'd hoped for, uh, to try to get a hold of Colonel Beach or me to, to see if there's anything else we can do to help with that. Yeah, Paul, I would say uh, being in Gateway Squadron, you're in pretty good shape uh, compared to some there's of the areas. Area. <laughs> uh, yeah, we actually have only about uh, three instructors between John Martin, Gil Frank, and uh, Blake McCall that are routinely available, uh, sort of routinely. Uh, Dave Chalinski is maxed out teaching at SLU and uh, we can never catch up with Hans with his uh, corporate uh, job. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I guess, I guess in, that, in that, uh, that respect, I've that. gone through the level one training, and uh, I'm basically, I think I'm ready to pair up with a with an instructor, but I haven't seen how that step gets kicked off at this point. I would uh, recommend you just get with Keith, and okay team up with an instructor and then work out the availability with that instructor. That's normally how it, how the process okay. goes. And um, I'm going to put up, uh, before we close, I'm going to put up our contact information on the screen. Uh, you can always send uh, Sam or I uh, an email as well. So now what we would do is turn around and contact the instructors in that area anyway. Um, so I would just go, um, get with Keith and the squadron there, and that's your best way to get started. They also have a lot of good pilots at the uh, at the squadron who aren't instructors, but who you could uh, mentor with, or they would mentor with you and help you weave through all the obsqualls and wimmers and all those other mysteries that we get into um, in cap flying. Yeah, the, the other thing is both the aircraft in St. Louis are uh, G-1000, so unless you've got G-1000 prior experience, there is a ground school uh, that has to be done. Uh, it does have to be led by an instructor, uh, but a, a qualified pilot can at least help you get the button pushing, you know, yeah. become a little more familiar <laughs> with it. Uh, I have about it. three hours in the uh, elite aviation, yeah, the elite ground school, so I'm... I'm I've started the journey. Yes. Yep. So all right. And, well, great. And, yeah, and that would help. So uh, Colonel Veach would be the the approving authority of that outside training uh, for the G one thousand, so that you don't have to go through the ground school and cap again, if needed. Oh, I'm going to need it. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was a question uh, in the chat after successful Form Five and approval to be a VFR pilot, but before achieving transport mission pilot, are there any funded opportunities? Uh, there is one very limited funded opportunity in that they are there is one what we call a proficiency profile uh, for VFR pilots that uh, basically gives you about an hour and a half to uh, where you have to go accomplish certain tasks. It's a certain number of takeoffs and landings uh, and, uh, you know, if possible, do some air work. Uh, so it, there is some, but the, you know, it's not meant to be that is your your only uh, flight time, uh, ideally, because otherwise, if you're if you're only flying an hour and a half a month, it's it's really not enough to either build the time or be proficient. Uh, you can use Civil Air Patrol aircraft self-funded uh, while you are a VFR pilot. Again, we have proficiency profiles that we call corporate profiles, where it tells you these are the tasks that you have to do. The only difference is uh, who is ultimately paying for the cost of the flight and the fuel. Uh, CAP does have a restriction against using CAP aircraft for personal flying. Um, so we do have to be very careful about that, of, you know, what the primary purpose of that flight is needs to be in line with those profiles. Uh, does CAP require a uh, instructor or second person on the flight? Uh, nope. Uh, once you get your Form 5, if you are qualified in that aircraft, uh, you can fly solo. Uh, while you're onboarding and training, obviously, uh, you do you are required to have an instructor. Uh, we do always encourage that they take up a crew 
uh, so that the uh, air crews can get benefit as well from any time that an aircraft is up in the air. They get to uh, practice their skill set as well. It's not just uh, all about the flying. Any other questions? All right. Well, I appreciate everyone attending um, tonight. And for those of you that uh, aren't uh, current uh, members of Civil Air Patrol, I definitely encourage you to uh, give us a look. And if you're a pilot, we will um, reach out and help you uh, start to fly with Civil Air Patrol. Um, as Sam mentioned, um, sometimes, I don't know how to say this, but uh, the, the best members that join that want to fly, want to want to provide a service uh, for Civil War Patrol as part of that. And at the end of the day, that allows you to have more fun within Civil War Patrol, uh, much more so than just flying their plane. So, but anyway, if you're at all interested in Civil War Patrol, um, please give us a look. I'm going to share the screen just enough so that you can get Sam and I's contact information here. Well, I was. I must have shut off the application. But anyway, um, if you want to get in touch with us, um, my email is simply rick. Yeah, could you put mine up there too, Sam? Thank you. That's a lot easier than sharing my screen. All right, folks. I appreciate everybody's attendance. Um, please send us an email if you have any questions. Yep. And if you do want a copy of the uh, the presentation in the or the video, please send me an email. I do not have a list of attendees and their email addresses, so I will not be able to just send it out unless you shoot me an email. Uh, that'll also give me a chance to you know uh, swap contact info if needed. So. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, uh, Colonel Beach, for uh, your time, as always. Greatly appreciated. All right. Thanks a lot, folks. Thank, thank you. you. And uh, if I could ask you to stick around for just a few more minutes, sir.